Can everybody hear me? Excellent. All right, thank you for turning out. My name is Evan Schwartz. I'm one of the co-inventors of the Interledger protocol, and I'm going to be talking about streaming payments and the future of interoperability. So first question, how many people have heard one of the terms Internet of value, Internet of money, Internet of blockchain, something like that? Fair number. Um, so the first time I heard this, I my reaction was, I think this is a BS marketing term. This is like Internet of Things just applied to something else. And with what I start, with the, the question I would pose is kind of why do people talk about this idea of the Internet of Value? And the answer is that today the payment landscape is super broken. If you're a website or you're some kind of merchant and you want to accept payments from different people, this is basically the landscape. These are the payment methods accepted by one website called uh, Prunetta.com. Um, this is crazy because all, they have to accept all of these different methods in order to support that user that might be coming and wanting to pay them. Second reason, um, how many people have heard the question, do you have Venmo? Raise your hand. A lot of people. What this is basically asking is, are we on the same net payment network? Can I send you a payment? Third scenario that I would pose is, what would happen if you went into a supermarket and said, excuse me, do you accept Ether? Or you know, pick your favorite cryptocurrency. And the answer is obviously like, if they would be like, excuse me, what are you talking about? And what the problem is, in payments today is that in order to pay someone, you need to be on the same payment network. And in order to accept payments, you need to accept a lot of different payment methods to support you know, that user that might come and want to give you some money. The fundamental issue here is that payment networks are at their core disconnected. You have lots of different types of payment networks, banks, blockchains, mobile money networks, etc. And some people sort of saw blockchain as like, oh, this will solve the problem. Except that you've just seen a proliferation of different blockchains, and it has very much not solved the problem. So blockchains are basically still just individual networks that are disconnected. So what we need is internetworking for payments. And I think the reason why people talk about the idea of the internet of value is there's, some, there's this aspect of the internet that just kind of works. Like, I'm on the internet, you're on the internet, yeah, we have different providers, but I can still just like send packets to you and it doesn't, we don't really have to think about it. I don't have to ask you like, are you on Comcast? Like that's a weird question to ask. Um, so what we need is a system for money that routes basically packets of money across different networks. So that's what Interledger is. Um, in brief, Interledger applies the architecture of the internet to money in order to enable streaming payments across every type of payment network. So I'm going to go through that piece by piece and explain what that means and what we're doing. So first off, applying the architecture of the internet. This is the architecture of the internet in a kind of rough diagram. Some of you may have seen this before, generally called the hourglass architecture. And the idea is that at the bottom layer, you have a lot of different networks. These are your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Ethernet. All of these different technologies are fundamentally disconnected. What the internet protocol added on top of that is this very simple routing layer of just, it's this packet that you can say, I have this data, please get it over there. And then on top of that, you can build a lot of different applications. So the internet doesn't care whether you're doing web or email or blockchain. It's just, that's just applications built on top of the same core protocol. This is the interledger architecture. You may notice some similarities. Um, at the bottom layer is the, the ledger layer. That's your, your blockchain, your banks, your payment channel networks or individual payment channels. That's the, the systems of value that we want to connect. That's where our money is sitting. What Interledger adds is this very simple routing layer that's taken a lot of inspiration from the internet, as I'll, I'll show. And then you can build a lot of different applications on top of that. So to go through some of the parallels between this, um, one thing I should say is that we started with this idea of the Internet of Value and trying to enable that kind of experience, but as we've gone on, we've realized there are more and more parallels between the two than we kind of started, so we didn't really start trying to copy stuff from the Internet, but at each turn, it was kind of like, huh, the Internet, like, they had a pretty good solution for that. Maybe we should just use that. Um, so some of these, some of these parallels are 
on the left here, uh, you have the IP packet, internet protocol packet, um, and it's got things like an address and the data, et cetera. On the right is the interledger packet. It has an address, an amount, some data, very, very similar. We basically went through all of the fields in the internet packet and went, oh, do we need this? Yeah, that applies. So that's one similarity. Another similarity that I find kind of funny to mention is that uh, when we were writing the initial draft of the internet interledger protocol spec, my colleague basically looked at RFC 791, which is IPv4, and he copied it over and did a search and replace on data to money, and it worked to describe what we were doing. And I was like, man, you can't like just rip off the internet protocol. But it's really crazy that it, that it was so applicable. Kind of fast forwarding, um, the thing that I'm working on right now is not copying TCP, but a more recent alternative to TCP called Quick that Google developed a couple of years ago. And so I'm, I've spent the last like week or so basically going through this 90 page spec and going frame by frame like, oh yeah, we'll need that, great, and implementing that on top of Interledger. So it's gotten to the point where it's so similar in architecture that we can actually like directly copy stuff over, which is really bizarre and I think is really cool. Happy to talk about that more later. So what this gets you, I'll talk a little bit about some of these streaming payments use cases. Streaming payments is a really wacky idea, but gives you a lot of cool stuff. So today payments are kind of a hassle. So we bundle up payments, like you'd much rather do a $10 a month payment than a payment for like an individual listen of a song or something like that. Um, because it's kind of annoying, like, okay, type in my credit card details, maybe you're gonna steal all my money, like, it's a, big, it's a big problem and it's kind of a hassle. And so what streaming payments are is like, if you apply the internet architecture to payments, you can get it such that, uh, yeah, I could very efficiently send you like a tiny, tiny bit of money, just like we can send tiny packets of data over the internet. So some of the use cases for this are things like paying for media as you're streaming it. Today you do your monthly subscription. You could have a setup which would be kind of wild and like user experience, quite, there are definitely user experience questions, but you could have a setup where you're paying for like a stream of video on a per second basis, where you give me a little bit of movie, I give you a little bit of money, and we keep, keep doing that throughout the interaction. You could also do this with developer services like hosting. What if you could pay on a per second basis for the hosting that you're using and to anybody in the world without really needing to like sign up for an account. It's just, I, give, I send money into your account, you give me service. So if this works, I will also show, let's see if this little, um, we'll show a little example of what this looks like for sending a bigger payment. So this was an example of like, you can use streaming payments, not just for really tiny payments, but this is paying in a kind of demo checkout environment where I wanna pay for some bigger amount. And you could kind of see it as like, imagine a progress bar for your payment going through. And how quickly it goes through depends on your bandwidth, which I'll come back to in a sec. Um, so, if it lets me keep going, that would be nice. Um, so yeah, streaming payments enable a lot of very cool stuff. It really changes the, the payment dynamic from one where payments are really kind of a hassle, we don't wanna do them very much, to oh yeah, I'll just like stream you a little bit of money and you could do this with any tiny increment. So the last part to talk about is doing this across every type of payment network. If we wanna get that experience of the internet, we have to be able to connect everything from blockchains to cash, as I will show. So. Oh, shucks, the graphics don't turn out so well. So on the left, this is a very dark icon that unfortunately is not showing up, but I won't worry too much about that. That shows cash. The second one is Lightning um, for the Lightning network, Bitcoin Lightning Network, um, XRP, Ethereum. These are just some examples, but these are ones that we have actually integrated. So there are many different payment networks in the world. We wanna connect all of them. And the question is, how do we send value across these different ones? So I have cash and you're a merchant and you're accepting payments through Ether or an ERC-20 token. How do I make this happen? 
So what we have is a series of connectors. Connectors you can think of like internet routers that route packets of money across different networks. And so a connector ha would have an account on two different, at least two different networks. And basically, you can think of them like a trader or kind of like an exchange or decentralized exchange. Um, so they forward packets from one network to another. Um, I won't go through the full details, but basically internet, interledger packets create obligations that are then settled afterwards. So inside of the packet, there's this condition. It's just a SHA-256 hash. What that gives is, as the sender, I send the packet with this condition, and I know when the connector gives me the pre-image of that hash, I know that the payment has gotten to the right place. And at that point, no money has actually moved or been exchanged. There's nothing enforced by the blockchain for reasons that I can discuss afterwards. But then the sender will just owe the connector the money, and they can settle up in a variety of different ways. What, basically what this turns out is you can use something like a payment channel to settle up very quickly. So you could settle up on the level of every single packet. I think if I'm the sender and you're the connector, then I send you the pack. Uh, yeah, I send you the packet, you forward it on, you give me the pre-image, and then I sign a payment channel update. And this is like a simple payment channel, nothing complicated. Um, this could be just like, in, if you're familiar with Bitcoin, like the check lock time verify style payment channels. Um, there's no hash time lock contract in there, just simple payment channel update. Slow links can be settled for larger amounts less frequently. So we could even do this with cash, where I'll, you'll just give me a $100 spending limit, and then I'll send interledger packets to you through that limit, and then when I hit that limit, I need to give you the cash. So you basically end up with the system where you need to find somebody in the, one of these connectors that's willing to trust you for a tiny little bit of money, and one of the things that comes out of this is that we think of this sort of liquidity and trust as bandwidth. So if you are very, very sketchy and untrustworthy, nobody wants to do business with you, you, can have, you might have a very low bandwidth connection where the amount of money that you can send at any given time is very limited because the connectors will say, I don't want you to have that much money in flight that's uncovered by the payment channel updates, for example. Um, so if you have, uh, you can also have higher bandwidth connections. So that's one of these other wacky parallels with the internet. So what we get from that is we can integrate a lot of different types of ledgers, even ledgers that are not built for this. That was one of the really key things about the internet was that it didn't just work over networks that were designed for the internet. Uh, at some point, there was people did an experiment where they tried to do IP over pigeons and found that even that worked. They described it as a somewhat low latency connection, but it still worked. And so the idea with Interledger is trying to be as neutral as possible and integrate just any type of network, even ones that are not designed to be integrated. And then on top of that, you can build a lot of different applications. So we've built some of these streaming payments applications, and I think there's a lot of other things to build. So in summary, Interledger is applying the internet's design to money to enable streaming payments across every different type of payment network. A little bit about the project. Interledger was invented at Ripple and spun out as a separate open source project. So I'm an employee of Ripple. I just happen to work full time on the Interledger project, and I've been working on it full time for the past three years. Um, we work on it as part of a W3C community group. So one important note is that Interledger is not a project that is trying to raise money. There's no blockchain, there's no token, there's no fundraising. It's just a kind of standards effort amongst a bunch of different companies that are interested in seeing this happen. Um, and the core of it really is just that data format for exchanging these Interledger packets. Right now, there's 300 contributors from, or a little more than 300 contributors from a wide variety of backgrounds, um, ranging from banks to blockchain companies to tech giants, et cetera. And the reason why I kind of mention that is just because it's a very use case agnostic protocol, uh, there's a lot of different people from different industries that are interested in it. So um, if you're interested in getting involved, these are a couple different ideas I will seed you with. So, Number one, build streaming payments into your applications or businesses. So if you're a developer building some kind of service and want to accept payments, this is a good way to do it because then anybody can pay you even if they're on a different payment network. If you're building an exchange or decentralized exchange, consider routing interledger packets. 
Um, number two, run an early connector and help connect all the ledgers. So we have integrations with um, Bitcoin, Lightning Network, um, Ethereum and ERC20 tokens and XRP and are looking for more people who want to connect more systems. We have this plug-in architecture that makes it easy to connect new systems. If you're interested in that, come talk to me afterwards. Um, number three, contribute to the, the protocols. So what can or what should we learn from the experiences of TCP and BGP? If you have a lot of networking experience, would love to talk. Number four, join the Interledger community group. We have bi-weekly calls, mailing list, et cetera, um, and help us spread the word. There's a lot of people have not heard about this project, I think in part because we're not fundraising and there's no way to like get rich quick off of it necessarily unless you build an actual business. Um, help us spread the word if you think this is cool. Um, and number five, we are just starting an Interledger Boston meetup, first in the world. So if you happen to live in Boston, we've got the first meetup on Tuesday. Um, and you can find those details on meetup.com. So help us build the internet of value. Now I don't hate that term so much because the longer we've worked on it, the more similar to the actual internet this has become. So now I think it's actually kind of a decent term for it. Thank you. Okay, time for one or two questions. Hi, thanks. This is great. So have you done any comparison with like other mechanisms, solutions for interoperability, like atomic swap or like a child parent chain of order stuff? Mm -hmm. Have you done some comparison of that? Yeah, so actually six months ago, I would have described Interledger as just a protocol for coordinating atomic swaps. And then we basically realized that atomic swaps are not good for payments. Um, and the key there comes from the time delay. Um, so with atomic swaps, you need to take into account quite a long processing time, um, and the intermediaries need to lock in an exchange rate for that whole time. So we basically had a system for doing proper atomic swaps on different systems, and then took those out because we realized they were too slow. If you want to ask more about that, I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. So atomic swaps guarantee that nobody can lose money, right? In your system, you've got uh, gateways in Ripple and your um, connectors, which are basically unregulated, uncollateralized, uninsured banks. And the system, both systems are going to fail in a very interesting and boring way. As soon as there's any movement of money across the network that has a net flow from one side to the other, they're going to be unable to satisfy withdrawals. And you have in your system inserted this concept of trust. The Bitcoin community has this concept of don't trust, verify. I don't know if I can trust a connector or a gateway. I'm not auditing their books. Good question. Okay, how so do I know? how do you know if the connector is actually able to send the money forward? So if you d have very little trust, you can either have a, the relationship pre-funded. So if a connector is willing to front you money, that's fine. Can you, can you or, rephrase everything you're saying without the word trust and tell me what you really mean? So basic. I think we should probably talk offline because we're about to run out of time, but happy to discuss this more. So um, you, have, you have a relationship, basically an accounting relationship, and you can settle up these packets afterwards or beforehand, depending on the direction of the, who's, it, who's willing to extend this tiny, tiny little bit of credit. One key thing in, in Interledger is that we kind of see there's a spectrum of how much you have to trust various people. So trusting the entire world, very bad situation. Completely agree. Finding one person in the world that you have some little bit of trust with up to a limit that you control, we think that's OK. Um, so you need to find somebody. If there's nobody, then you would have a very low bandwidth connection or may need to pre-fund pre it with them. Let's talk off offline about that. So that's all for this. Thank you very much. Come find me if you're interested in talking. Thank you, Evan.